Hello, I am romance reader and reviewer Liz Donatelli. Welcome to Reader Seeks Romance, a romance novel talk show that features entertaining interviews with authors and publishing insiders. My guest this episode is historical romance author Ava Lee. Ava and I chatted about her 1980s inspired Regency era romance series, The Union of the Rakes, her novel, Would I Lie to the Duke, and much more. Ava also played a game that tests both her knowledge of 80s movies and Regency era English. Enjoy. Welcome, Ava, to Reader Seeks Romance. Thank you. It's so good to be here. Thank you. Lovely to see you. So you write Regency romance series, Union of the Rakes. The yes. stories center on five gentlemen who became friends in a breakfast club movie type scenario. Right. First things first, how do you define rake in the series? And why are your rakes prime romance hero material? Well, in this instance for my union of the rakes, there's a couple reasons why I called it that. First of all, because I'm a huge Duran Duran fan. Like I have been since elementary school. So that was a little shout out to my favorite band in the world. Um, and uh, so when I was searching for titles, I thought union of the rakes would be kind of a fun way to do that. And in a way, it's almost ironically utilized in this series because um, the five uh, men who meet as boys in Eaton, only one of them really could be qualified as a rake. Um, and that's the Duke, who's also the popular one. Um, and we have a scholar who's the nerdy one. We have a guy who's a sportsman who becomes a soldier. We have the kind of the criminal, criminal one. And then we have the weird one. And out of all of them, really only one of them is the rake. So they're really just kind of being, uh, they're 14 year old boys when they meet. So I like to think that 14 year old boys are a little hyperbolic when they're thinking about themselves. So um, I think in this instance, these rakes are not exactly rakes, but they're rake adjacent. I am 100% Gen X. I was born in 1973, so that sets me square within the demographic of somebody from um, the Gen, Gen X. And that included the fact that both of my parents worked, and that included the fact that I would come home from school and basically be on my own for several hours until they came home. So that meant watching an inordinate amount of cable television, um, probably most of it inappropriate, <laughs> given my age. And then also, um, I watched a lot of music uh, music videos. So that was kind of a formative decade for me because that's when I was really exploring writing. And um, I really became a writer in elementary school. That's when I started. I was even writing, I guess what you would call Duran Duran fan fiction before I knew such a thing mm -hmm. existed. So I'd have, you know, these adventures of the guys and, you know, insert some kind of cool female character um, who was a cipher, obviously, for this one. Also, the 80s was when I was, um, I started reading romance. A friend of mine in high school started giving me her mother's romances, and I started reading them. And um, it's not a long journey for a lot of people to um, start reading them and then want to start writing them themselves. So in a sense, the 80s, the films, the music, um, and romance were all sort of intertwined. And I started as a historical romance reader. So in a way, I was taking a lot of these very trope-heavy 1980s movies and thinking about applying them to these Regency settings. And um, they're fairly timeless tropes. So I think you can take the makeover story or the, um, the business, in, like the, the, the secret identity story, and then transport that into a Regency setting. And it, I felt that it worked pretty well. I read a lot of Judith McNaught. I read Jude Devereaux. I read Joanna Lindsay. And then later on, like Mary Jo Putney, I think became one of my favorites. This was the 80s, so some of the gender politics were a little um, troubling to me. Mm -hmm. And so I think one of the reasons why I started writing romance was because I was like, I'm going to do it different, you know. And like the first romance that I ever wrote, but I never finished, I started it in high school. The heroine was the captain of a pirate ship, and she captures the wealthy heroes, the ship that the wealthy heroes on, and she sells them into indentured servitude. That kind of sets a bar for like where my mind was at in terms of how I wanted my romances <laughs> to play well, out. Would you consider um, reworking that into a full-length novel? Never. 
it's lost to time and we're all eternally grateful for that. <laughs> Tell me about the most recent novel in Union of the Rakes, Would I Lie to the Duke? So What I Lie to the Duke is a story about a talented um, business, a person with a, a lot of information and knowledge about business. But because she is born, she's a, a farmer's daughter and she's a woman, she doesn't really have entree into the world of business. And so, um, and her family has a soap has a soap farm, and um, it's a, a business that's in trouble. So when she gets the opportunity to infiltrate a Shark Tank like uh, business scenario, um, also known as Dragon's Den um, in the, in the UK, she takes this opportunity to use a disguise to infiltrate that bazaar so that she can help save her family's business. But what she didn't count on was there's a uh, a man at the bazaar who's the Duke of Rotherby who is um, in every way her equals, like he's a, he's a, obviously he's a Duke, so, um, and an attractive Duke, and um, they get along really well. And the closer they get, the harder it is for her to maintain this lie because he thinks that she's a title woman, but she's actually a farmer's daughter. So um, there's a lot of fun tension um, that happens between that. And also they have a very uh, sexy relationship that's kind of predicated a lot on power dynamics that we don't often get to see, especially in historical romances. I enjoy historical romance, particularly Regency, because of the language. Uh, yes. It's sophisticated, it's robust, it's emotive, and you do such a beautiful job of language. Can you briefly walk me through like word choice? For instance, how do you know whether to use the word impecunious or poor? And that word is in your book. That's why I picked it. When you're writing historical romance and historical fiction, you have to think about like what you, what words were actually in you. And while I'm not necessarily trying to write, um, I'm, I'm not trying to emulate Jane Austen's language mm -hmm. per se, or Walter, Sir Walter Scott or somebody like that. So I need to make the language accessible to a 21st century audience while also maintaining the flavor and rhythm and certain aspects of it. So that's super important. Um, and I love words, I've always loved words. It's, it's reversed in my screen, but that word up there on my bookshelf is luminous, which is one it. of my favorite words. And so I just love words. And so I like to play with them. But when I'm writing um, uh, this book, I, or books in general, it's like what I try to do is think about who's saying it and in what context. So somebody might, uh, somebody with a certain kind of level of education or socioeconomic status would use the word impecunious, while another person might use the word poor, um, or somebody would say the word poor if they're trying to be, um, they're, they're trying to be a little more um, direct and um, they're speaking a little more agitatedly or something like that. So they wouldn't be searching for a, multi, a polysyllabic word. You know what I mean? So it's like, it's very contextual. Do you write some sentences just to get them down in modern day English and then you go back and maybe, you know, Regency it up a little? I think actually my tendency is to write a little more ornately and then I have to pare it back considering who's speaking. So it really is, um, you do the sort of method acting where you try to determine like who's saying what. And so when I get into the mindset of writing Regency romance, the dialogue and the discourse just kind of, it sort of happens. And so I use that speech pattern and stuff like that. I don't have to think, okay, now I have to write like a Regency person. It's more like, what am I saying in this particular character? What I like to the Duke flips the script for Regency women most noticeably in the bedroom. Um, yes. Your protagonist, Jess, she's single, she w was engaged, she's not a virgin, she's sexually expressive. How do you balance historical accuracy and progressive modern day beliefs like such sex positivity in this case? I feel like that kind of notion of historical accuracy has been weaponized in a pretty problematic way mm -hmm. um, throughout in historical romance in terms of inclusion and representation. And um, I also feel that that's ap applicable to women's roles and women's sexuality, because um, there were, uh, I don't think that the 20th century was the first uh, era to ever invent this notion of sexual equality or sexual liberation, or that, the, that women could enjoy sex without feeling shamed for it. And um, we get to hear those loud voices shouting, no, no, this is, we're going to slut shame, we're going to do all of these things. Mm -hmm. But they're the loudest, they're the ones who um, suppress other voices and other narratives. And so I know that that, um, I take that into account. 
I know that um, kink and sort of power play and all kinds of sexual dynamics, that was definitely not invented in the, you know, in the 19th or 20th or 21st century. Those are things that have been going on for a really long time. I mean, we have lots of documentation of it. So, I mean, um, BDSM um, was definitely a popular activity in the 18th century. We have like literal representations of a documentation. There was a, pro a house of prostitution that specialized in it on Charlotte Street in London. I mean, these things were real. So uh, when people said to push back a, a, against these notions of, you know, this kind of sexual equality, I'm like, well, why are you pushing this particular narrative? Who's telling you this and why are they telling you that? And so I feel like we can kind of deconstruct that and really analyze uh, our own misconceptions because what we're reading is a representation. It's not a historical document. So why do we represent this, but not this? I have translated the titles of five 1980s Hollywood films into Regency era English. Number one, Best Blunderbuss. Top Gun. Yes. Number two, Scandalous Quadrio. Dirty Dancing. Yes. Six and Ten Glims. Uh, Sixteen Candles. That's right. Glims, I learned, are candles. They're also eyes. They're oh. Playing for eyes. Well, eyes? Okay. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Number four. One Dicked in the Knob Summer. One Crazy Summer? <laughs> I can't say that one. Yes, you are correct. <laughs> A John Cusack classic. Number five. Three Viscounts and a Lullaby Cheat. Uh, three Men and a Baby. Five for five. <laughs> um, Lullaby Cheat. When I found that, I was like, I have to find some title with a baby. Uh, have you ever used Lullaby Cheat? Because I think you might have to now. Well, no, but the thing is that I generally don't put children or babies in my story, so... Um, well, someone could say you're acting like a lullaby cheat. I guess that's true. I could put that in there. So the next book in the series is the third book in the Union of the Rick series called Waiting for a Scott Like You. And if you've read the other two books in the series, you'll know that McCameron is going to be the hero of this book. And the uh, film inspiration can be found in his name. You can think about that. Who do we know from an 80s movie whose name sounds like McCameron? Hmm. If you're thinking Ferris Bueller's Day Off, then you're correct. And uh, the heroine of that book, Lady Ferris, also makes an appearance in um, um, would I Lie to the Duke? And as you may have noticed, she's also about, she's 12 years older than him. So it's a road story that takes its inspiration from both Ferris Bueller's Day Off and also the John Cusack film, The Sure Thing. It's going to be very, 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 very sexy. I love it. I love you, Ava. Uh, thank, thank you. I love you, Liz. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for taking time to visit me here at uh, Reader Seeks Romance. Well, thank you for having me. This was a lot of fun. And if you um, think of more 80s titles uh, translated into Regency speak, let me know because uh, I'm there for that. And if you want to do song titles too, I'm there for that too. Yay!